somewhere, someone from this small town is keeping one big secret. Welcome to Clearfield, Iowa, population 278. This is the place where 14-year-old Colleen Simpson vanished in the night. Living in a small town can be tough. There's not a lot to do, and everyone knows your business. Tiny towns like this aren't known for keeping secrets, especially not for long. But today, I'm telling the stories of two small town cold cases, unsolved mysteries, and closely held secrets that have persisted now for almost 50 years. These are the stories of two young women, Christine Seal and Colleen Simpson, both taken from tiny towns. Christine Anna Seal was 22 years old when she mysteriously disappeared from the tiny town of Verona, Missouri in 1972. Verona is very similar to Clearfield. The population there was just under 500 in 1972, so a little bit bigger, but still a very small farming community. And it's located just about five hours directly south of here in southwestern Missouri. Christine, her husband Lynn, and their young son David lived in a little trailer home on Route 2, one and a half miles north of town, on the Calico Dairy Farm where Lynn worked. It was the day after Father's Day, Monday, June 19, 1972. That morning, Christine turned the alarm off at 7 a.m. Her husband quietly got out of bed and got dressed, letting Christine go back to sleep. Lynn told authorities that he fixed some toast for himself and left for work at about 8 without speaking a single word to his wife. Then, at around 9.30 that morning, Lynn's boss at the dairy farm where he worked asked him and one of his co-workers to return to his house to retrieve two motorcycles for use for herding cattle. When Lynn got back home, he found his son crying in the kitchen alone. Mommy is gone. Where's mommy? Two-year-old David asked his father. While concerned, Lynn was not initially alarmed. At first, I didn't realize she was gone, he told reporters. Then I thought she might have fallen in the bathtub, but she wasn't there either. Next, Lynn checked the garden behind their home, but Christine wasn't there. She was nowhere to be found. Her purse was on the kitchen table and her car was in the driveway. Nothing in the home was disturbed. The only clothes missing were the ones that she'd been wearing, her red and white polka dotted nighty and her bathrobe. All of her shoes remained in the home. Wherever she was, Christine was barefoot. Lynn called the two people closest to his wife, her parents, Doyle and Trudy, to ask if they had seen Christine that day, but they had not. He called his boss, Paul Calico, who quickly came to the property to help Lynn and his coworker, Don Jenkins, look for Christine. When no evidence of her presence could be found, Paul called the sheriff's office. Unfortunately, the sheriff was out of town. Lawrence County Deputy Dean Stockton acted in his absence and they searched from noon until sundown. Many friends and volunteers joined the approximately 40 lawmen from multiple sheriff's offices to participate in the search for Christine that first day. A bloodhound arrived and traced Christine's scent from the bedroom of the mobile home to the driveway. The scent vanished behind her parked car. On the second day of the search, more bloodhounds were brought in, but none could track her scent past the driveway. Had Christine been abducted and taken away in a car? Authorities created a grid map and methodically marked off areas where they had searched for Christine. Deputies and volunteers searched on foot, horseback, or motorcycle, but found no evidence of the missing woman. Daryl Meyer, the SEAL's mail carrier, approached authorities and told them that he had passed their trailer home at about 9.35 that Monday and had seen Christine's son, David, standing in the doorway, looking upset. The mail carrier had thought perhaps that David was mad that his mother wouldn't let him out to play. I thought he was just crying because his mother wouldn't let him come outside, Daryl said. 
I know she thought too much of the boy to run off without letting anybody know. The mailman was not alone in this assessment. No one believed that Christine would have left her son David alone in the home by choice. Elsie Riggle, a co-owner at the grocery store that Christine frequented, called Christine a marvelous woman, also saying she wasn't the type to run off. She was very quiet and mature for her age. She used to come in with that little boy after she'd come home from work in Monette. I think she was taken away. Known as Chris by those closest to her, people described Christine Seal as a natural beauty that was honest and kind. Her boss, Dwayne Mars, called her a dependable employee and a devoted mother. She was, quote, not an outgoing type individual, but never seemed unhappy. She was happy with life. Christine had been born in November of 1949 to Trudy and Doyle Nickel. Her father, Doyle, was in the army, so they moved around a lot during her childhood. She and her younger brother, Bruce, lived in New Jersey, Kansas, Kentucky, and then Hawaii before Doyle retired and they settled in Cassville, Missouri. There, while finishing high school, Christine met Lynn Seal, described as a slender, though muscular young man with red hair. The two dated exclusively for two years and then married the summer after Lynn graduated high school in July of 1968. Christine had graduated the previous year and had started at a local beauty school to further her education. In 1969, Christine gave birth to their son, David Allen. They moved to the Calco Dairy Farm for Lynn's job the following year, and everyone felt that they were happy there. Christine enjoyed being a mother and liked her part-time job at Duane's Beauty Shop in nearby Monette. Because they had moved so much when Christine was younger, she was closer than usual to her parents, and in particular, her mother. Lynn said, there was no one closer to her than her mother, and she would have at least let her know if she was going to leave. Christine's mother, Trudy, confirmed to authorities that Christine had no plans to leave Lynn, no plans to abandon her home or child. Lynn said further, my wife wasn't the type to get out and run around. I know there was only one reason Chris would have left David, and that would be if someone threatened her. Who had taken Christine from her home that morning? We do not have clue one, Lawrence County Deputy Sheriff Boyd Haddock told a reporter. In the days following her disappearance, there were two reports from people who saw women that they believed may have been Christine. One witness saw a woman walking along a highway in southwest Missouri, approximately 50 miles from Christine's home. The lady walking fit Christine's description, but no one else had seen the woman on the road, and despite an investigation, nothing came of the lead. Another witness reported seeing something suspicious two days after Christine's disappearance. This person had pulled over near the Lee Church, northwest of Verona, about two miles from the Seals' trailer, to change a tire. The man reported seeing a nude woman run out the back door of the church, up a hill and over a ridge. The church had been otherwise unoccupied that Wednesday afternoon, so the man called authorities, and working on the assumption that the woman was Christine, law enforcement arranged search parties that worked long into the night looking for clues, but found nothing. Hundreds of volunteers, as well as law enforcement officers from eight area agencies had joined search parties for Christine. One county provided an airplane to be used in the search. Five miles in every direction of their small Verona home had been inspected, but no trace of Christine was ever found. When it came to Christine's mysterious disappearance, law enforcement initially suspected Lynn's involvement. He was, after all, her husband, and had been the last person to see Christine alive. But they found no evidence that implicated him in her disappearance, and no evidence of violence in their home. However, Trudy Nickel, Christine's mother, questioned how they could have, given the state of the scene that Monday. Trudy told, 
KY3 News that she had a terrible feeling as soon as they got to the farm. When she and Christine's father arrived, it was overrun with people. Nothing was secured, and many volunteers were going in and out of the trailer. It had never been treated as a crime scene. Trudy reportedly saw deputies finish partially smoked cigarette butts off of the ground. She later told a reporter, so all the people were in and out of that trailer, so there were no fingerprints. There was nothing. Law enforcement in the area had been more accustomed to dealing with burglaries and vandalism than murders or kidnappings. A missing person was a big deal in that small town. Everyone had come out to help in the search, but had that caused more harm than good? The mystery of it all was cause for concern, and for the first time, many residents of Verona began to lock their doors at night. Nine days after Christine was last seen, the community announced a reward. Residents of Verona, along with the SEAL's friends and co-workers, had raised $1,000 to be given to any person or persons who could provide information about the whereabouts of Christine. Eventually, this fund tops $2,000, and at that point, authorities actually became concerned that anyone with information might hold out to see if the reward fund would grow higher. So they issue another announcement that the total would be frozen at that amount, and they set a deadline to submit leads. One year. Sadly, that deadline passes a year later with no success, and everyone's money is returned. It's been a long year, Lynn told Mike Serbrug of the Joplin Globe. The fellows did a thorough job, he says, about the search for Christine by local law enforcement, though he had also called the FBI and asked that they investigate. But FBI agents refused, telling him that they needed proof that Christine was taken from the trailer. The sheriff says he can't find that proof, Lynn says. If officials would only listen to our friends who have told them that something is wrong, they would know she didn't walk out on her own. Lynn holds on to hope that he'll find his wife, saying, I think I'll still find her. It may not be the way I'd like to find her. If anybody knows anything, I hope they'll say something. Deputy Sheriff Glenn Huffman says that Christine's case isn't closed and won't be until she's found saying she is still classified as missing. We have received numerous false reports, but nothing concrete. As with many small towns, people talk a lot amongst themselves, particularly about something as strange and unique as a missing person. Gossip and rumors covered many theories about Christine's disappearance. Some believed that the young mother had simply run away. Others were sure that Lynn or his family were involved. In her book, Missing and Murdered in Missouri, Barbara Kem Heighton writes that Lynn's father, Carl, was considered to be quite strict. Reportedly, many people, including Christine, were afraid of Carl. When Christine and Lynn first married, Lynn had gotten a job in Springfield, but he quit that job to work for his father without pay. When their son David arrived, Christine had been the sole breadwinner for the family. When money got tight, Lynn took the job at the Calico Dairy Farm so that he could help support them. Reportedly, this caused some tension with Christine's father-in-law, who was now down a helping hand at his farm. Notably, it was also the day after Father's Day that Christine was last seen, a day that they had spent with her family and not Lynn's. But when asked, law enforcement dismissed the senior SEAL's intimidating nature as to just rumor. And while Christine's friend and co-worker Helen confirmed that Christine had been uneasy around Carl SEAL, she also said that Christine was skittish around their boss, Dwayne, whose reprimands sometimes made her cry at the beauty shop where they worked. During an interview with the media, Lynn said, I'd like to thank everyone for what they've done and for the days they spent searching for her. I think maybe it was someone I knew that took her, but it wasn't a friend. I don't have friends like that. After another year without Christine passed, 
Lynn divorced her. Eventually, he remarried. His new wife adopted David, and the family moved to Georgia. Seven years after her disappearance, Christine was declared legally dead. In the years since then, Christine's brother Bruce discovered that there were never any files or records created by law enforcement during the search for Christine in 1972. Lieutenant Chris Berry, current supervisor at the Lawrence County Sheriff's Office Detective Division, said that detectives at the time would not have seen the need for a file. He said, quote, just someone leaving was no reason to create a file. Which I think, despite the breadth of their searches, speaks to the depth of the investigation that actually occurred or didn't occur. It's really quite unfortunate that this case wasn't treated with more seriousness back then. Lieutenant Barry reopened the investigation into Christine's disappearance in 2019. His team brought in anthropology dogs who scoured the Verona countryside for evidence. They spent 16 hours searching the old Calico farm as well as the locations of several nearby ponds. They looked through many fields and dogs hit on two locations, but nothing linked to Christine was discovered. Lieutenant Barry now believes that a deathbed confession is their only chance for a conclusion. Current Lawrence County Sheriff Brad DeLay called this case puzzling from the beginning. He admits that without records from the 1970s, much vital information may be lost. But he says, quote, it is still our hope that someone somewhere will have that one clue to help us solve this case and provide justice for Christine. We will continue to follow up on any lead that may come in and will still work to provide closure for all involved. Christine was born November 2nd, 1949, making tomorrow her 74th birthday. She has been missing for 51 years. When she disappeared in 1972, Christine was five foot eight inches tall and approximately 125 pounds. She had blue eyes and her usually brown hair had been frosted blonde. Tips and leads in Christine's disappearance should be directed to the Lawrence County Sheriff's Department. Three years later, in October of 1975, a new small town mystery was about to begin, right here in Clearfield. Did Colleen Simpson run away, or had she too been taken from her home? Colleen was a lot like Christine. She was a tall, thin brunette who moved around frequently as a kid. Her father was also an army man, a Silver Star and Purple Heart recipient who was honorably discharged just before she was born. The family found a home in this tiny town, and as a high schooler, she met someone and fell in love. Colleen Simpson was still a high schooler, just 14 years old, when she vanished in the night from her Clearfield, Iowa home. It was a Saturday night, homecoming weekend, and Colleen had just gotten into the biggest fight of her life with her parents. Frustrated and angry, Colleen's father sent her to her room that night before leaving for work as a deputy on night patrol. When it came time for breakfast the next day, they found that Colleen was gone. Clearfield is such a small community that there is no police station or sheriff's department in town. Therefore, when she was reported missing, it was to the Taylor County Sheriff's Office in the neighboring town of Bedford, where her father worked. Taylor County is also incredibly rural, with a population density of only 16 people per square mile in 1975. At first, the media report that no foul play is suspected. And I believe that this is because Colleen had left a note. She was mad at her parents, and the note implied that she had left home of her own free will. But eventually, authorities changed their mind about Colleen's disappearance, and today she's designated as a person missing under circumstances indicating that his or her physical safety is in danger. 
She's reported as a possible stranger abduction because Colleen never came back. She never reached out to her siblings with whom she had no conflict. She never spoke a word again to her friends from school or from 4-H. Colleen left the house that Saturday night upset, but as far as anyone is concerned, she never reappeared anywhere. This was of course out of character for Colleen with no history of running away. And it's also pretty bizarre for the area. How do you run away from here in 1975? Clearfield is such a small town that it has no bus stops. It has no train station, no taxi service, and of course no airport. The only way in and out of town is on foot or by car. So what would an angry teenager do? Go to a friend's house maybe? But what, hide and live there forever? Never go to school again? How do you disappear from a tiny town like this even today? In small communities such as these, everyone talks. Maybe she hitchhiked, but someone had to have helped Colleen run away that night. Who was it? And where did she disappear to? One of the most heartbreaking things about this case is that we know so little about it and so little about Colleen. Unlike Christine, news of Colleen's disappearance barely makes the papers. One brief article from the Creston News Advertiser printed 25 days after she was last seen requests the public's help locating her, but it does not even include her description. Unlike Christine, Colleen's family remains mostly quiet about the hunt for their missing child. In 1993, nearly 18 years after her mysterious disappearance, they did their first media interview with KCRG Channel 9 News. It's a piece called Stranger Danger. And the next year, in August of 1994, the Cedar Rapids Gazette mentions Colleen as one of just three Iowans missing and believed abducted by a stranger. Uh, those other two are Des Moines Register newspaper delivery boys Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin. But despite this new detail about a possible stranger abduction, the article focuses on other cases. While there is little information available about Colleen's case through traditional media sources, additional details have come out through the internet more recently. Colleen had four siblings, and her brother Mike remembers the argument that night that she disappeared. He writes about it on Colleen's Iowa Cold Cases page. He remembers Colleen telling their parents that she was pregnant, and then his dad sending her to her room before leaving for work. It makes me wonder, was this conflict about her pregnancy the reason her family stayed quiet for so long? Certainly, teenage runaways were treated differently in the 70s, but Colleen was so young and vulnerable. It may or may not be relevant to note, but in addition to being pregnant, Colleen was also severely underweight. She's listed as being five foot seven inches tall and only 90 pounds. A body mass index of 14.1 puts her in the first percentile for her age. There is no indication that she suffered from any health issues or disordered eating, but at 14, severely underweight and pregnant, Colleen could have benefited from the attention of medical professionals. Media from 1975 does report that the Taylor County Sheriff's Office investigated several rumors, but that no solid information regarding Colleen's location was uncovered. I have to believe that the contents of the note was investigated and any known boyfriend questioned, but it seems likely that just as with Christine Seal, there was no investigation file created in the 70s no interviews recorded or search maps saved. On the other hand, Jerry Simpson, Colleen's father, was an officer of the law. He came from a family of law enforcement officers, and eventually he becomes a small town police chief, one who continued to 
pursue clues in his daughter's disappearance. Perhaps he did keep detailed records. Again, with so little public information about this case, it's hard to speculate the past or current state of the investigation. In 2006, police in Los Angeles released a collection of 54 photos of unidentified women believed to be victims of the serial killer William Bradford. Sentenced to death for several California murders in the 1980s, Bradford was suspected of killing dozens of young women and teens across the nation, and was active in the Midwest in the late 70s. Bradford had used the promise of modeling careers to lure his victims to remote locations and take pictures in the moments before their deaths. When detectives found the photos among his possessions after he passed away, they sought to solve cold cases with their release. Jerry Simpson had been hopeful for an end to his painful quest for answers when he learned that one of the girls pictured looked like his daughter. However, after some investigation, it is determined that the girl is not Colleen, and the woman pictured had been found alive. It's not her, Jerry is quoted as saying. We are still waiting. Sadly, Jerry Simpson dies, still waiting for news of his daughter in 2010. His wife and Colleen's mother, Margaret Simpson, had worn a necklace with Colleen's school photo around her neck until the day that she died in 2005. Colleen's siblings continue to hope for answers in the disappearance of their sister. They've submitted DNA to various services, hoping to locate her or any children she may have had. Several age-progressed images have been created in Colleen's likeness. However, no recent news or progress has been announced in Colleen's case. Presumably, there is no official investigation today. The state of Iowa has no cold case unit and no public safety officers dedicated to working on cold cases. Though this may soon change, a bill going through the Iowa Senate right now would establish a cold case investigation unit if passed. Iowa residents can call or write their local legislators and ask them to support this bill, SF2234. A dedicated unit could mean answers in some of the state's oldest cold cases and unsolved mysteries. At the time of her disappearance, Colleen Simpson was five foot seven inches tall. She had black hair, hazel eyes, and a moon-shaped scar on her right forearm. If you have any information regarding Colleen Simpson's unsolved disappearance, please contact the Taylor County Sheriff's Office.